Welcome, Joystick Justice League, to episode two of JGL Live. I'm Mike Frusius, your host, and this is my new weekly news roundup, where I essentially give my analysis, critique, and insight into the best and worst headlines that I find across AAAs, indies, as well as Microsoft, Sony, and Nintendo. So before I get started, need to kind of give you a heads up on why this episode came out a couple days later than I intended. Last week, as you might remember, I told you that I, my intention with this show is to get it out on the weekend so that we can kind of review the weekend news and then get ready for the coming week. Well, here we are sitting, it's it's right now, it's Monday afternoon, I'm still recording this because I didn't really anticipate the strain of research that I was gonna be facing last week. There were a lot of headlines and a lot of really interesting things going on. And by the time I actually got to wrap my head around it all on Saturday and Sunday, I kind of ran out of time for recording. So here we are a little bit late. I have a new strategy going forward for more of a daily news roundup to get myself ready for recording on the weekend. So hopefully you'll see it more of a timely, consistent fashion. But on the plus side, at least you won't have to wait as long for episode three to come out this coming weekend. So anyway, um, so we're gonna break down third party news in this first segment, move on to some Sony, Microsoft, Nintendo news after that, and then wrap up things with this other segment I like to call The Greek Speaks, where I talk about uh, various uh, issues within the game industry, things that are happening now or in the future, and it gives me a chance to kind of tackle one topic with some insight. So later on we're gonna be talking about cloud gaming and what I'd like to see in the future of that. So. Back to our 30 party news roundup for this first segment of JGL Live. I want to talk about uh, what's happening not only in the AAA industry as a whole, but how that also relates to changes in the mobile industry that are being initiated by Apple. But let's get back to the AAA industry and I want to talk about one game in particular, uh, Assassin's Creed Unity. Because I feel that as I read more and more news about this, like the game is about two weeks old. Okay, It came out on November 11th, it's been out for a couple weeks. And there's still a lot of negative press surrounding it that's playing it beyond the launch day issues of just, you know, bugs and online issues, but going even deeper. And, and I'm finding, as I read more and more about Assassin's Creed Unity, I'm finding it's starting to represent what's wrong with the larger AAA industry as a whole. So, I'll be honest. Another, in the, in the interest of transparency, I told you last week that I'm gonna try to approach this show radio style, kind of putting myself in the mindset that I only have one try to get it done and just record whatever comes out. Well, that hasn't really happened. It's actually literally taking me about 30 tries just to do this Assassin's Creed segment. So over time, you know, I'll get, I'll, I'll work the kinks out, but it, it kind of shows you that there's just so much going on with this game that I, I need to wrap my head around it. So let's, let's break it down. I mentioned that, yeah, the game has bugs, but that's not, that is kind of a big deal because it, it sh one thing I noticed from all the reviews and what, what was a common critique was that the game feels rushed, even more so than other years. And, and, I was, and I was warning about this for a long time. Now, I'll admit that I'm not an Assassin's Creed fanboy. I've never finished an Assassin's Creed game. I've played quite a few of them. I tried one, I tried Assassin's Creed Brotherhood, three, and I had Black Flag for a spell last year before kind of giving it up on it. The series never really drew me in, but I, I do follow it. And I have a lot of friends who are really into the series and I, and I always ask for their opinions in addition just to reading, reading the regular professional reviews out there. And, and one thing they're all saying is that Beyond just the bugs from launch day and the online connectivity issues, there's inherent flaws that can't be changed in the game itself. Going down to what it, what amounts to be pretty much a mediocre story and a mediocre main character, and, and, and this is the problem I've been talking about with a long time, where Ubisoft is annualizing the Assassin's Creed franchise and in my view, watering it down. The, you, you, when you have this triple A big budget experience, it, it's really hard to expect a bunch of developers to, to deliver that in a timely fashion year after year. It, it, it just kind of, it goes against the whole notion of artistry where you, you give the time that's needed to fully flesh out a project. That's why games like GTA V, by contrast, 
come out of the gate with a 97 Metacritic score because you know that at least five or six years of hard work has gone into crafting that experience and polishing it and making sure that it's good from day one. I'm not saying that GTA 5 isn't without its problems too. You know, it has some online connectivity issues on the PS4 that I've seen so far. But overall, from a game perspective, it's just a lot more polished. And, and I think, based on uh, an article I saw in Game Industry Biz last week, that Ubisoft Montreal is starting to respond to these criticisms about the dilution of the Assassin's Creed franchise. And they've even said that from now on going forward, the series is going to be handled on, on like a two-year development cycle, going back and forth between Ubisoft Montreal and Ubisoft Quebec, which I think is the right strategy. I, I, I see that they're learning from Activision's mistakes, where for the longest time, same thing with the Call of Duty series, it, it was coming out on a yearly basis, and it just felt like it was getting rushed out to, to, to meet that holiday sales window and that the product was suffering. And now... To kind of counter that, Activision has promised a three-year development cycle where Call of Duty will go between Sledgehammer Games, Infinity Ward, and Treyarch, and we're already starting to see the payoff. I mean, look how good Call of Duty Advanced Warfare turned out because Sledgehammer had the time to put the polish on the game to make sure it was working properly, that it was hitting out of, on all cylinders. And I'm hoping that Ubisoft is going to learn from their mistakes this year by not only putting out a rushed version of Unity, but also shoehorning in a last-gen Assassin's Creed in the form of Assassin's Creed Rogue. I mean, we just didn't need all that content. And, and you know, that's the funny thing, too. Looking at Gamergeddon last week, November 18th and beyond, where just pretty pretty much every game, major game, came out of, uh, under the sun on the same day. We had Far Cry 4, we had Dragon's Age Inquisition, GTA 5 Next Gen, Little Big Planet 3, WWE, WWE 2K15 for Next Gen, and then a couple of days after we had Smash Brothers. So while Assassin's Creed on PS4 may have been leading the global software charts until last week, it'll be interesting to see how it fares now that fellow Ubisoft game came, Far Cry 4 came out and has done better metacritically than Assassin's Creed did. I mean, really, most of the games that came out last week did better critically than Assassin's Creed did. Assassin's Creed sitting at about a 75 right now, and whereas Dragon's Age, Far Cry 4, and GTA 5 are all at least 85 or beyond. And it's funny because I was reading an article in Forbes last week that kind of got me thinking about this whole Assassin's Creed segment. It was written by Eric Kane, and he made some really good points about the trouble that Assassin's Creed might now face leading into holiday season, having all these bugs. And, and it's it's not just the bugs. It's not just the rust nature of the story. We're going to get into some other things that are kind of troubling Assassin's Creed too. But he made the good point about Metacritic and, and love or hate Metacritic. And I know the industry is divided on Metacritic. Some people think it should be abolished. I think it needs to be tweaked because it is important in making snap buying decisions and getting like kind of an, a, a bigger picture of the industry. But regardless, Assassin's Creed had about a week window on top of Gamer getting to, to get a 75 Metacritic score out the door. And, and yeah, it did well for the first week. It sold over a million copies. But Eric Kane makes a good point that is it going to survive that, that window of opportunity with all the problems it has, with all the negative press it's getting? And I, I think the problem, a lot of that problem may come down to the fact that Ubisoft unwisely chose to embargo the reviews for, for Assassin's Creed. Now, let's get into that for a second as to why that's important. And Jim, Jim Sterling on Jimquisition last week made a really good video. I think it was Review Ubisoft or something talking about review embargoes and how consumers are starting to wake up to what these embargoes really mean. So let's put this in perspective. Assassin's Creed, the reviews weren't allowed to go out publicly until the morning of Tuesday, November 11th, well after all of the midnight release people went and bought it, all of the people that woke up in the morning went and bought it. This didn't show up till 12 p.m. Eastern time on most review sites, so it was kind of a similar situation where you had to take your gamble. You couldn't read the review ahead of time. You had to just kind of say, okay, well, it's Assassin's Creed. I assume that it's going to be good. And for the most part, it was. But 
that's the thing. When, when the embargo was up and you start to see all of these mediocre reviews come out, you start to think back to games like Aliens, Colonial Marines, and the shitstorm that happened around that, the review embargo that, ha that, that forced the reviews to come out late and suckers like me ended up buying it in advance thinking that it was going to be awesome when we found out it wasn't. Jim Sterling makes a really good point in the sense that people are getting wise to these review embargoes in the sense that it shows a lack of faith in the product. It, it, it kind of, when you see a game like Dragon's Inquisition come out by contrast, when the review comes out a week early, giving it like this stunning review, it shows faith in the product. Whereas by contrast, it shows that Ubisoft had reservations about Assassin's Creed. They knew they were rushing out. And I don't understand, like they had Far Cry 4 coming out. Why couldn't they have pushed Assassin's Creed till early next year? They, they could have done that. There were so many other games coming out that they could have just delayed it worked out the bugs, maybe rewritten some scenes or something and put out next year to much greater acclaim and maybe better sales. But now, because it's coming out in this glut of other more higher rated titles, it may get lost in the shuffle. It remains to be seen. I wanna see what the sales results are gonna be this week, but it just shows the problem with this whole holiday rush attitude that everybody needs to get their game out before Christmas. And unfortunately, some games are gonna suffer because they're trying to meet this stupid release window. We have to stop expecting that an Assassin's Creed game is gonna come out every November. It should come out when it's ready. But even beyond that, Monday and Matt, uh, not too long ago, uh, kind of, he's a big Assassin's Creed fan and he criticized the game on another level for its flagrant use of in-game microtransactions. And this is, this is starting to become a thing in a lot of AAA releases, more so than others, but it, it's, it's disconcerting, okay, to see that, that publishers are getting so greedy. And, and the one thing that Monday Matt said that really stuck out my mind, and, and, re, and he really nailed it, he said that the stuff that you're buying in Assassin's Creed basically amounts to what we knew as cheat codes back in the 80s and 90s. And if you remember back in the 80s and 90s, you would put in a cheat code and you'd unlock something extra for your game. Now they've taken cheat codes and relabeled them in-game purchases, which I think is, is gonna backfire. I mean, when you already have all this negative press around Assassin's Creed that the story's getting watered down, that it's getting rushed to market, it's coming out with bugs, it's not, it's, it's like half finished. To further gouge the consumer and slap them in the face with in-game transactions that could that are already on disc that you have to pay to unlock is not good policy. All right, and this is leading into my next story about Apple. Apple was in the news last week in a similar vein. There's this major backlash towards not only free to play but microtransactions. That's not only affecting Assassin's Creed but the 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 industry in general. If you watch South Park, you'll notice that the sixth episode of this 18th season was called Freemium Isn't Free, and they basically, what a brilliant episode. In a nutshell, the kids get their hands on this Terrence and Phillip mobile game that's similar to Clash of Clans, and it's one of those freemium pay to wait kind of games where you have to keep purchasing in-game consumables, and eventually Stan racks up this huge phone bill and it forces them to go find out what's going on with the Minister of Mobile Gaming in Canada, who turns out to be Satan, explaining <laughs> the whole con psychology of how freemium isn't free and how the game loop forces you to spend more money with psychological cons. It's, it's, it's too hard to encapsulate that whole episode right here, but in effect, it nailed what a lot of us we're concerned about in terms of where not only the mobile industry is going, but the triple industry is going in terms of DLC and, and price gouging. And I think that the South Park episode was an effective mouthpiece. And I wouldn't say that it really directly led to what I'm gonna talk about with Apple to wrap things up here for this first segment, but it definitely had an effect. So getting back to Apple, article last week that Apple is getting out of the free to play business. So now, soon enough, you're not gonna see the word free anymore. When you go to the Apple I, the, the App Store, what used to be free is now gonna be relabeled with a get button. So this is essentially an alarm saying where the mobile industry is gonna be going from here on in. Apple is making a firm stance, responding to criticisms, and this really has to do with the 32.5 million dollar lawsuit that they recently settled, wherein a whole bunch of parents did this class action lawsuit complaining that their kids were racking up thousands of dollars in their phone bills because they weren't properly 
uh, inform they, they hadn't received proper informed consent and that was the whole issue so now not only is Apple now and a lot of mobile developers now required to put disclaimers in front of their game saying that this game will require in-game purchases to continue but now they've had to change their whole philosophy and how they market these games to the public and, and I think that kind of spells the end of this whole plague of, of freemium isn't free games in not only the mobile market but now the console market I have to wrap this up because this this section is going long. But I was reading GamesIndustry.biz and Glitchsoft CEO Andrew Fisher reports that mobile devs are, mobile developers are actually moving away from consumables on the whole. I mean, you're seeing this with Disney, EA, and GameLoft, and specifically Glitchsoft's Uncanny X Men: Days of Future Past game that recently came out is proposing this new structure that they want to go with for this new model where you pay up front for a premium game, a core game, two to three bucks. And then instead of being forced to buy consumables and microtransactions, if you like the game, they'll provide episodic content. So, regardless uh, of what 2000 happened in 2014, all the garbage we saw, and I, and I told people from the beginning that this was going to be a transition year for the industry. A lot of new things were happening. A lot of things were going to succeed. A lot of things were going to fail in terms of marketing, in terms of hype. We're seeing what went wrong, but now we're also starting to see what happened that's gonna be that's gonna be happening right. I can't even speak properly in 2015. And I think Apple has taken a, a great first step in, in pronouncing the the future attitude towards free to play and possibly the end of all this gouging. So we've run out of time for the first episode. That was kind of all over, all over the place, but you can kind of see my point as to why it's, it's good to see that Ubisoft is taking a better attitude towards the Assassin's Creed franchise and I think the whole industry can learn from that. Stay tuned, we're coming back with Sony News in part two after this, JJ Alive, Mike Freesius from the Joystick Justice League. See you in a bit.